over the last six or so years, Heidi and I have been leading retreats into northern Minnesota at a luxury resort in the middle of winter. It is cold. And we have been teaching people how to cold adapt so that they are feeling warmer all winter. They love the winter rather than try to run away from the winter and dread the winter. They fall in love with a new season that they never thought they could love because they learn how to properly adapt themselves through their light environment, diet, movement, and a specific sequence of cold adaptation to fall in love with the winter, to make themselves bulletproof for the whole winter. What I've done over the years is had this idea that there's a way of living in the winter that makes us optimally healthy in a northern climate. Now, these are climates where it gets cold. Not that it has to be below zero, but if it snows in your area, then this will work for you. And this is based on ancient pathways buried in our DNA that most of us never access. And when we access these pathways, we awaken processes in the body that have, in many cases, never been used and help support our physiology throughout the colder times to make life more fun. Why do I say that? It's because we can open up these pathways in our DNA and our mitochondria that most people are not tapping into, and we can make the winter experience much more enjoyable for just about all of you watching this video. And over the years, I have called this the hibernation diet. In fact, I wrote a book called The Hibernation Diet. And the reason that I have the word diet in the name is because honestly, 5 million diet books are written every year, or at least sell every year. So people love to purchase books about dieting. But in fact, this is an entire way of living. It's a lifestyle for the winter that's different than your lifestyle in the summer that's made to mimic ancient patterns that our ancestors would have used to enliven our biology and make the winter a far better experience for most of us. And I'm going to give you the summary of what the hibernation diet is or the winter lifestyle to turn on these ancient pathways that we can all use as it starts to get colder. Again, if you're living on the equator, you may never turn these on and you probably don't need to because you have the perfect light environment, assuming you're outdoors. But if like the most, the majority of us living up here in the cold, above a certain parallel, you know, if you are above Georgia, essentially, you get cold enough in the winter that these techniques can be helpful. So I'm going to take you through a few steps that you can tune into in the wintertime in order to have a much better experience. So I will summarize at the end the very specific things to do, but right now I'm going to walk you through a little bit more of the detail. So first of all, let's just start off when you awaken. So when we awaken in the wintertime, often if we're synced up to the light and dark cycles of Earth, and we work a full-time job. For most of us, that means that we have to be up before the sun rises, right about in the beginning of the fall or even the end of the summer. So as of right now, when I'm filming this video, it is September 17th, and it is still technically summer. However, when I awaken at 5 a.m. or even 6 a.m., the sun is still not up yet. So often we're arising in the winter before the sun rises. Even if you're circadian synced, we will often arise about 45 minutes to a half hour before sunrise. And in deep winter, even earlier, mostly because we have to go to work. So when we wake up, the very first thing most of us are doing are looking at our phones. I mean, we can go on and on about how much this phone has become a part of our lives where today we can't leave the house or go to the bathroom or sleep without our phones. I mean, tell me if that's not true. So if you have your phone next to your head on the nightstand or under your pillow, which most people do, you're going to look at it first thing in the morning. And that is going to destroy 
a lot of the health that you've been building throughout all your other practices. So number one, I'm not saying that you can't look at your phone first thing in the morning. In fact, most people will because they are going to use it as their alarm clock. So great, you use it as your alarm clock, but you can't look at your phone first thing in the morning. So what do you do? Okay, keep a pair of blue light blocking glasses at your bedside on your nightstand or on the floor next to your bed, however you have your bedroom set up, put them on before you turn your alarm clock off or the, your phone. So before you pick up your phone and see that bright light and turn the alarm off, throw your pair of blue light blocking glasses on, which are gonna block the blue light from hitting your eye, which is an altered man-made form of blue light that does not mimic sunrise. It's gonna give your body a signal that it's noon when you see that bright of blue light, that amount of blue light without the red, infrared, or ultraviolet is present at like noon time. And your brain is gonna get this signal like massively spike cortisol, it is noon, and it will give you a circadian rhythm mismatch. Put on your blue light blocking glasses, turn off your alarm. The first light you should see without glasses, sunglasses, or contacts is sunrise. So when you awaken, do not look at your phone first thing without your blue light blocking glasses on. Honestly, it's not that hard to do. Just keep them next to your bed. It's not a big deal, but it will have an impact on your health vis-a-vis -vis your circadian rhythm. Next, if you have time in the, I don't like to say the word morning because I'm not morning anything when I awaken, but after you wake up, if you have time before you have to be at work or get kids to school, whatever it is. And honestly, I hope you can build time in the, the rising time to do this, right? So get up and give yourself at least a half hour, but at a minimum 10 minutes even, right before you brush your teeth, get in front of a red and infrared light. Now, why do I recommend this? When we come indoors in the winter, we lose frequencies of sunlight. Really everything that we're doing is to mimic nature because we've moved so far away from nature. So in this chaotic modern world that we all live in, how do we maintain and build optimal health? And it is through the use of natural cues introduced to our body in the right ways that we lack. So when we come indoors in the winter, most of us spend 95% of our time indoors. In fact, in the winter, it's more like 98% of the time indoors. We miss out on all the natural frequencies of electromagnetics from the sun. It's not just visible light that we get. You know, ultraviolet is invisible, so is infrared. And there are multitudes of other invisible frequencies of light that do things for our body that are not even studied. In fact, they might be studied, but you don't know about them. So if you can't get out and get sunrise on your body and skin every single day, especially because it's pretty cold, and often if the sun is rising at eight, you are at work. Most of us are at work. So I have this protocol that I developed for winter time called the SAD protocol. I developed this myself and it's uh, SAD, the Seasonal Effectiveness Disorder Protocol. Most people uh, in the winter can get some depression, some higher anxiety, they are tired all the time. And it's because we come indoors and we're missing natural frequencies of light and we replace them with man-made altered frequencies of light that are not designed for our health, but are designed to allow us to see when it's dark. Now, just because you can see when it's dark doesn't mean that that light doesn't have an effect on your biology, it does. So this protocol, I operate it first thing in the morning, first thing at sunrise or when I awaken. And that's because I have time to do it then. You could do it at any point during the day, but I like to awaken and I go right down into my closet. Sounds a little weird, um, but in my closet are panels of lights and I have a red and infrared light and an ultraviolet light. And I expose my entire naked body to those frequencies. And that's what I recommend is I recommend everybody get a red and infrared light. They are not expensive anymore. They used to be, now they're very affordable. So get a red and infrared light and an ultraviolet light that has ultraviolet B. 
that's going to allow you to create vitamin D in your skin in winter when most everybody is deficient. In fact, more than 85% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D and they are more deficient in the winter. We're deficient all the time, but in the winter it gets worse. And that's when we need it the most. So the SAD protocol is to bring back the frequencies of light that we're missing. We're missing red, infrared, and ultraviolet when we come indoors. Those frequencies of light rarely pass through windows. In some cases, none of them pass through the window. And in some cases, 50% are lost by coming through the window. So not only do we have shorter lengths of light in the winter, we're indoors behind glass, and we're missing these critical frequencies for our health. You can bring them back with a red and infrared light panel. There's lots of brands out there that you can buy from and an ultraviolet light. Nobody that I know so far has combined red, infrared, and ultraviolet unless they're growing plants in their basement and then they need all those frequencies. There's a real niche here that nobody has covered. For now, you can get a Sperdi, S-P-E-R-T-I. That's an ultraviolet lamp. It's like a tanning lamp. And you can get uh, one that creates vitamin D or hormone D. It's like the Spurdy D lamp. Or you can get one that's the Fiji sun lamp. I like to have ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. So I use the red Spurdy Fiji sun lamp. It gives me both ultraviolet A and B frequencies. Where the vitamin D Spurdy lamp is probably only going to give you UVB light, but no UVA. And I just like to include as many frequencies as I can if I'm getting ultraviolet light. So that's really up to you, but that's the red light protocol is to utilize your red, infrared, and ultraviolet wavelengths that you're missing by coming indoors and reintroduce them to the body. And I'll tell you what, like any of those people buying super bright, sad lights for their desk that are really blue, we're already blue light toxic. You don't need more blue light. So those lights are not super effective and they can actually make things worse, in my opinion. Red, infrared, and ultraviolet are what we're missing. So begin your day with those things. And also the other light that we're missing is heat from the sun in like mid and far infrared wavelengths. So if you can either in the AM or at night before bed, sauna, even if it's any time during the day, really, whenever it works for you, if you can get into a sauna most days of the week, this is associated with increased longevity in every study that I have seen. Now, we're missing those frequencies and you're not going to get them from the red light panels. So if you can add a sauna somewhere into your day, even if it's once or twice a week, that can massively improve your health in the winter. Plus, great time to detox because you're sweating. So there's multiple benefits to using the sauna. Next. We're still here in AM around sunrise. You're going to need to hydrate yourself. Barbara O'Neill says like water your garden because you've been releasing water for more than seven hours. Some people eight hours and some people 12 hours without hydrating. So we have lost some water. We need to get some structured water. I like to use reverse osmosis, structured water with added electrolytes so that I'm getting my minerals in the water. I'm not getting any of the nasty stuff like fluoride fluoride, chlorine, and pharmaceuticals. I'm just getting pure structured water with the electrolytes that are going to be helpful for my body. So first thing, hydrate yourself. Some people like a oh, hot lemon water, whatever it is that you're going to either use to detox, hydrate, etc. Do that first thing in the AM at rising time, no matter whether you do it before the red light, after the red light, it doesn't matter. Next, you want to get outdoors at sunrise. This is almost a non-negotiable at every point of the year. And remember the sun rises at a different time every day, all year. It is never at the same time, except for three days at winter solstice. So winter solstice is the three days of darkness if you're a conspiracy theorist um, or whatever you wanna call it, where the sun stands still. It rises at the same time every day for three days days in a row. And that's the low point of the sun. The sun gets to its lowest point and its lowest energy all year. And then it starts to rise at an earlier time, all the way until June 21st, summer solstice. 
and then it starts to decline again. There's all these cycles that are built into everything that we know about from religion to all sorts of things to our holidays. And we really don't think about them, even our conspiracy theories. So get outside at sunrise. If you can't be outside, can you crack a window in your office, in your home, so that you get light that's not through glass? Can you roll your window down or your sunroof when you're driving to work? I don't care if it's 20 below zero. You can crack the window a little bit to get natural light to set your circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm, massively impactful for health, and most people never see the sunrise or the sunset in winter. And they wonder why they feel so much worse and so much more depressed during the winter time. Next, most of us want a warm beverage. So again, if it's winter and you're cold and you want something warm, here's some of the ideas. And it's like a warm water with lemon it can be very detoxifying. And you can also do cacao. So some people, if you want to fast, then you're going to want just black coffee, hot water, or some tea, no additives. If you're fasting, you can create more of like a ketogenic fast mimicking drink where it's not going to be a complete fast because you're having calories, but you know, the whole bulletproof thing where you add MCT oil or C8 and you add uh, coconut oil, whatever version of oil you want, plus or minus butter and some sort of sweetener potentially that's non-caloric. Potentially that can mimic the majority of a fast, keep you into an intermittent fast without a lot of the downsides of introducing calories that are carbohydrate or protein focused. However, I don't usually in the winter time recommend coffee that early in the morning, especially before the sun rises, because it introduces a high level of cortisol into the body and that can really spike your cortisol throughout the entire day. You'll be riding at a higher level of cortisol. So honestly, if you want like a warm beverage that's coffee-like, there's like versions of coffee mimickers like dandelion blend. I think they call it dandy blend, but also cacao is becoming really popular. So you could do a warm or a hot cacao and add your whatever, heavy cream, your monk fruit, because it's winter time, you don't want a lot of sweeteners that are high glycemic sweeteners like honey, sugar, et cetera. You don't want to add those things in the winter if you can avoid it, because that's part of the hibernation diet. Those things are not available in the winter. We don't want to spike our blood sugar in the winter the same way we would in the summer. So cacao um, or a hot water or tea is going to be better than coffee. And I'm not saying you can't drink coffee. You can certainly do it if you wish, but it's always better to wait on the coffee unless you do decaf. So you could totally do a decaf in the morning. Wait until about 9 or 10 a.m. before you drink your caffeinated coffee with whatever additives. It really is a better circadian timing to get the caffeine in. And for me and for most people who have studied this, they see a better cortisol, that's our stress hormone, a better stress level throughout the whole day if you have your caffeine later in the morning or later in the early time of the day. It really does make a big difference. Now, after you've had your beverage, if you're doing intermittent fasting, which many of us tend to do in the winter time because we want to burn our body fat, we want to be in a more ketogenic state. Not that you have to intermittent fast to be ketogenic. You don't. But if you are intermittent fasting, most of us, fast until 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., somewhere in there. It depends on when you finish dinner and how long of an intermittent fast you're doing. So often we're intermittent fasting. We're just having warm beverages of whatever that variety is or just plain water. Totally fine. Don't have to have a hot beverage. So, you know, in the wintertime for men, typically like 16 to 18 hours is like the ideal intermittent fast if you're not doing a 24-hour total fast. For women, it can vary based on your cycle. And I always refer you back to either Heidi or Dr. Mindy Pels. She wrote a book called Fasting Like a Girl. It is wonderful to teach women how to fast and when to fast 
that works better with their cycle and makes it far easier than trying to do the same things men do in terms of fasting. Our hormones are not the same and we fast differently. So a lot of the intermittent fasting advice you've heard comes from men on studies done on men and the physiology of women is different and you should fast a little differently. And I wish that they would do that. And they did through Dr. Minnie Pallas. So check her out. Next, if at all possible, before you start work, before you start your day, get in a fasted cardio session, not hit high intensity interval, not like crazy cardio, just some movement. A walk is best. But if you want to go for a really slow jog or run or whatever it is, or a treadmill or a bike or, or whatever it is, I keep my blue light blocking glasses on all the way until sun rises. So I'm still wearing my glasses this whole time, including when I get to work until the sun rises, then I take them off. This is pretty important. And most people just like never even want to consider it, but it will absolutely boost your health in the winter by doing this. Next, that fasted walk or slow and steady cardio before you've eaten your breakfast or breakfast can make a big difference in up-regulating fat burning, burning your own body fat. You used up all the sugars or a lot of the sugars that were in your muscles and your liver overnight. So as you're doing this morning movement, you're now having to tap into fat stores. That helps you in a ketogenic state, have more energy. But if you want to lose some weight, it also helps with that. So this morning or AM movement session fasted is really a great idea if you can get it in. Next, see the sunrise. So remember, take off your blue light blocking glasses, your glasses, sunglasses, contacts, get a little bit of that light information around sunrise into your eyes, if at all possible, through an open window, be outside, whatever it is and you go and you do your thing in the morning, whatever it is, and then you get your caffeinated coffee, nine to 10 a.m., hopefully you can wait that long, and then if you have the ability to, the best circadian timing to get a workout in is usually between like noon and 4 p.m., kind of the best timing when you have the highest body temperature, you're the most awake and alert, and you're the most coordinated. So if you can get a workout in, before you break your fast, that's great. If you're trying to build muscle, you might want to have some protein, amino acids, whatever it is before the workout, and then eat right when the workout is completed. So if you can get your workout in around lunchtime when the sun is at its strongest, then eat, breaking your fast, your intermittent fast. If you chose to do such a thing, that would be the time. And what are we eating? We're eating a largely ketogenic diet in the deep winter, because throughout the fall and early winter, we've been eating these carbohydrates, like squashes, pumpkins, apples, these things that are available in the local environments and keep for a certain amount of time till we get to deep winter. And to me, that's after about winter solstice, I start getting into a ketogenic state for the rest of the winter until about spring. So ketogenic diet is higher fat, lower carbohydrates, that's typically what's available in the winter. And honestly, it makes me feel better to eat that way in the winter than to try to eat a bunch of carbohydrates. It just doesn't work with the information from the sun into our eyes and our brain and our body, giving us this signal that it's deep winter. And then we feed ourselves bananas and carbohydrates and sugars. And the body's like, whoa, I thought these things weren't available based on what the light is that I'm reading. There's a mismatch here. So if you can avoid that circadian mismatch in the winter, I highly recommend. And I honestly think you're just going to feel better. And that's part of the hibernation diet. This food intake timing and the type of food we eat does set and modify our circadian rhythm. And in fact, you can read all the research studies that say like meal timing affects circadian rhythm. So what else are we going to do? We are going to attempt, if at all possible, to have your last meal of the day, some of us call that dinner, some people call it tea, depending on where you live, have that last meal of the day before sunset. I know, sometimes the sun sets at 4.30 where I live in the winter, sometimes at like 4.15. Do I eat my dinner at 3.30 in the winter? Yes, I do, if at all possible. Not every single day, but most days, I'm able to finish my dinner by 3.30. 
super early for some people, but I tell you what, if you finish eating before dark, it makes a huge difference on your sleep, but also on your winter health. Your cells want to sleep and they want to do different things when it's dark than they do during the day. There's lots of studies out there. You can read if you want to go to the science that say people that eat after dark have higher levels of obesity. So like if you can stop eating before dark, do it. Have a nice big meal around two or three if you can. I know not everybody can do this, but if you can manage it, it makes a big difference. And I encourage you to do what you can to try to make that happen. All right, so we've had our meal and the sun sets. Now we see the sunset outdoors if you can, through a window if you can't. And honestly, sunrise is more important than sunset, but if you can see it, it does help you get better sleep at night. And it has lots of information that feeds our body and sinks us to the place where we live on this earth. Now you're gonna put on your blue light blocking glasses. Honestly, thousands of peer reviewed published studies show over and over and over that artificial light at night is associated with diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and cancer. You don't want any of those things, so put on your blue light blocking glasses to stop the artificial light at night. Yep, that's 4.30 during the deep winter here in Wisconsin. Put them on, wear them until you go to bed, and you are going to be better off via every study that shows they save your melatonin. Like get a pair that you love, get a pair that you look really good in and wear them. When are you gonna go to bed in winter? So based on the book, Lights Out by T.S. Wiley. I love this book. It was published in 1999. And there's even an earlier book that talks about this same thing. Get more sleep in the winter. Like get less sleep in the summer. There's more light. But in the winter, the sun sets really early. And if you can go to bed an hour, a half hour, two hours earlier in the winter, I know everyone's busy. Everyone wants to get a thousand things done in a day. You can be healthier by getting more sleep in the winter by going to bed earlier and getting up then at the same time. Honestly, I will sometimes go to bed at seven o'clock at night in the winter. Do I get as much done as I do in the summer? No. Is your health worth protecting more than making an extra $500 or $5,000 this year? For some people, maybe they really need the $5,000, but for most of us, just get some more sleep in the winter and you're going to have a better overall life. You're going to be happier. You're going to be healthier. So if you can go to bed earlier in the winter than you would in the summer and get more hours of sleep in the winter, if at all possible. Winter is the time to go in, to hibernate, to rejuvenate, and to reverse the things that we did in the summer. And you need this time to come inside. If nothing else, like turn the lights out and do some meditation. Listen to some YouTube videos that are spiritual. Like do something that's a little different than you would in the summer. And if you're able to, once a week or once a month, think about doing a 24 hour fast. And the secret that I have learned is 24 hour fast made easier than anything else you could do is to have dinner at like 3.30, make it a really big meal, stop eating, and don't eat again until the next day at 3.30. That means you get to eat every day of your 24 hour fast. There's not one full daylight time that you're not eating. Eat at 3.30, go to bed, have some black coffee, tea, whatever it is, no calories during the day. And then at 3.30 the next day, you get to eat another big dinner. That's a 24 hour fast. So to me, that is the easiest way. Some people say breakfast to breakfast works better for them. Honestly, like for me, I like to eat a little bit later in the day. I can go all, all the time up until noon or two without eating and feel totally fine. But if you feel better, like breakfast to breakfast, again, you get to eat every day of the fast and you still did a 24 hour fast. If you can do one of those a month or one of those a week, it can really clean up a lot of like senescent or damaged cells in the body and just like take out the garbage. You got to take out the garbage once in a while. You can't just let it accumulate in the house. Even if you eat really healthy food, there's still some waste that you got to clean out. So that's a whole day. And what you can add to that is some cold adaptation. We have a series of videos on that. But what you're going to do is number one, change the way you eat. 
you're changing when you eat and what you eat. You should not be eating tons of fruits, tons of sugars throughout the winter. Your body needs a break. That's how you set yourself up for diabetes. It's like constantly pushing the sugar, especially in the winter. Give your body a break, like get off the sugar, get off the high carbohydrates. You're not doing it for the whole year. You're not doing it for the rest of your life. You're just changing the way you eat for like three months. It's not a big deal. Next, you're going to sleep more. It's winter time. It gets dark early. Give your body like a little vacation, get a little more sleep and add in this like sad protocol, bring in some of the frequencies of light that are missing because we don't live outdoors in the winter. Like our ancestors might've been outdoors a lot more in the winter. They might've been taking baths in a running water, like a running river when it's cold out. We don't do that kind of stuff. So stretch yourself a little bit, but add back some of those missing frequencies. If you can add a sauna session in, add a sauna session. Get the blue light blocking glasses, way more important in the winter than they ever were in the summer. I guarantee it. And if you can eat like mostly a ketogenic diet in the winter and think about doing a little more intermittent fasting than you would in the summer, I think those things make for a much more enjoyable winter. And it's how our biology was created. Like we're created to live in a Northern climate differently in the winter than how we would live in the summer. If you take advantage of that, I think, and my experience has been over years of doing this and helping others do the same thing, that you're going to have a better, healthier, and more enjoyable winter.